David Friedman is not an ANCAP. In fact, he can scarcely even be described as an anarchist. Here's why. Friedman takes centre stage in many introductory videos to anarcho-capitalism, appearing as one of the faces to the movement to outsiders. But this portrayal could not be further from the truth, and I'll show you exactly why. First, I must explain what anarcho-capitalism even is. Anarchism in general refers to the set of philosophies centering around the prohibition of rulers, but what a ruler is differs between schools of thought. Proto-anarchists lacked a strong scientific basis for their convictions as to what counted as voluntary as opposed to involuntary. Thus, Proudhon and his peers can be found decrying wage labour, saying that it's coercive and would not exist in a free society. And even more recent thinkers, such as Lysander Spooner, relied on an imprecise basis for their anarchism, which is where Murray Rothbard comes in with his new anarcho-capitalism. I am, therefore, strongly tempted to call myself an individualist anarchist. Except for the fact that Spooner and Tucker have, in a sense, preempted that name for their doctrine, and that from that doctrine I have certain differences. Politically, these differences are minor, and therefore the system that I advocate is very close to theirs, but economically, the differences are substantial. Those substantial differences come about due to Rothbard's adherence to the Austrian School of Economics and its science of human action, praxeology. Praxeology provides the stable and precise grounding for anarchist philosophy that was missing before. Of note here is that anarchism as no rulersism is a position on law, that is, it is a position on the proper way to deal with conflicts. An anarchist necessarily gives precedence to the non-ruler over the ruler in any given conflict. This is a normative position. The non-ruler ought win the conflict. David Friedman has a different approach to law, stating two types of rights, moral and legal. A moral right to do X, says Friedman, is an argument, although not a necessarily sufficient argument, that someone who prevents me from doing it is acting wrongly. These moral rights do not correspond to the anarchist understanding of property rights, as they do not say anything with respect to justice, so we move on to Friedman's legal rights. From the legal standpoint, rights are a description of either what the law says or of how it is enforced. On the latter interpretation, I have a right to do X translates as something like, if I do X, the police will not arrest me. If someone tries to stop me from doing X, the police will arrest him. Friedman sees both his legal and his moral rights as being insufficient to understand property rights, which I wholeheartedly agree with, but he errs in then moving on to a positive account of rights, an account which is both amoral and illegal one in which rights, in particular property rights, are a consequence of strategic behaviour and may exist with no moral or legal support. This account amounts to essentially a theory describing when people choose to aggress and when they choose not to aggress, but this is flawed in the outset in that it has no underlying property theory to even understand what aggression is in the first place. So even if we grant him the ground that people will indeed aggress when he thinks they will, we still need natural law for his theory to make any sense. This legal backing provides an objective theory of property rights which must lie antecedent to any discussion of when people may or may not violate those rights. Unfortunately, Friedman does not make explicit what property theory he is using in the background. He goes on. In thinking about issues of rights, I find myself playing two quite different roles. As a human being and an amateur philosopher, I have moral intuitions. From that standpoint, the question is, why ought one not to steal? And the answer is, because it is wicked. As an economist, I ask and answer different questions. One is, what are the consequences of people being free to steal? Much of the economic analysis of law is devoted to answering questions of that sort. Another is, why do people often not steal? This essay is an attempt to answer that final sort of question. I have tried to answer the economist's question about rights rather than the philosopher's, not because economics is more important than moral philosophy, but because I am more confident in my ability to use economics to produce answers. I have been encouraged in this policy by a curious and convenient coincidence. In most cases, the rules I conclude to be efficient are also the rules I believe to be just. Here, Friedman outright states that his account is an economic one, not a moral or ethical one. And to be clear, I am not attacking Friedman for choosing to write about economics as opposed to ethics. Rather, I attack those supporters of Friedman who use his analysis as a starting point for questions of law, rather than keeping it squarely where it belongs, in economics. On a related note, as there does not exist a Friedmanite legal philosophy, there can be no corresponding Friedmanite position on anarchism versus statism, as such a position would be normative in nature, which is absent in Friedman's theory. When pondering anarchism versus statism, we must analyse the anarchist versus the statist ethic, as opposed to thinking about what would happen should either system be adhered to. This is because even if we go through all that hard work of demonstrating, say, that an anarchist society will have a greater standard living in the long run than a statist one, we still lack any corresponding reason as to why that makes anarchism better than statism. Not only would this argument be entirely unconvincing to high time preference people who don't give a damn about the long run, or those welfare leeches who will indeed be worse off in the long run under anarchy, but even to the low time preference 
men who would be better off, we have only demonstrated that they prefer anarchism not that they should be anarchists as opposed to statists. Rather, in following this approach of economics first, we've retreated into legal whim-worshipping. Our argument is of the form, you should be an anarchist because you would prefer anarchy to a state. But the fact that some set of people do indeed prefer anarchism to statism does not imply that they should be anarchists. It may well be the case that John would prefer to rape Jane than to not rape her, but this doesn't mean that he should rape her. In fact, it's the case that he should not rape her. The moral argument stands far stronger in demonstrating the truth of the anarchist ethic. Everyone should be an anarchist, whether they like it or not. Furthermore, to take the David Friedman position as the root of law is to remove any theoretic distinction between anarchism and statism. Allow me to explain. To the legal David Friedmanite, who I should call the polycentrist, Law is decided by negotiations between rights enforcement agencies and arbitration on unsolved issues. So imagine there are two communities right next to each other. One wants the right to play music super loudly, and the other wants the right to have peace and quiet. The polycentrist has no objective basis to determine whether the music players have the right to play. Rather, they must leave it to arbitration to decide who has the property right. Essentially, either the two communities are governed by the same REA, or they're governed by different ones. In the former case, the polycentrist says that law on this matter is determined by reference to the REA's policies. So if they have a policy saying that you can't play music loud, then you're not allowed. In the latter case, however, Law can only be determined insofar as both the agencies agree on what it should be. Of course, this leaves us with no solution when they happen to not agree. This presents quite the problem in that law is only relevant when people aren't in harmonious agreement about how things should be done. When there's total cooperation, there exists no conflict. Furthermore, if law is determined by the say-so of judges, what would prevent them from simply claiming that competition with them is disallowed? David Friedman does not provide us with any objective class theory to define state as opposed to non-state. The Austrians, on the other hand, do have such a class theory, allowing Austrians, or more specifically anarcho-capitalists, to claim the title of anarchist. To be an anarchist, you have to first know what anarchism means, and if you want to know what anarchism means, you have to watch this video or explain that anarcho-capitalism is the solution to law. Thus, Proudhon and his que queers. <laughs> Thus, Proudhon and his peers can. <laughs> <laughs>